from the period, the comma is the most often used punctuation mark in writing. However, it is the most consistently used, misused, and abused punctuation mark in the English language. So, I've condensed all about the 15 to 20 comma rules into seven basic comma rules that if you master them, you will be the king or queen of your news feed or you'll be receiving A's on all of your academic writing. So let's get started. Comma rule number one. You want to separate or list items in a series. So if you like soccer, football, and basketball, those are three items and you want to separate those with a comma. I like soccer, comma, football, comma, and basketball. One typically error that we don't really find um, because people know this rule off gate is people will put the comma after the and. No, you put the comma before the and. And never gets a comma after it because it is almost like a comma itself. So it doesn't really need a comma after it. So it doesn't matter how many items in a series you have. You can have eight items. When you have that last item and you have the and in front of the last item, that's where that final comma goes. Rule number two. Separate two or more adjectives. Sometimes you need two words to describe something. Remember, an adjective is something that describes or modifies a noun or another adjective. So when you have two or more adjectives, you need to separate comma. You need to have a comma separating them. So the resilient, headstrong woman or the resilient, comma, headstrong comma come back Carolina Tar Heels I have three adjectives describing my Carolina Tar Heels therefore I need commas separating each of them remember if you think about a comma as a natural pause then you'll be able to easily easily see where commas should go rule number three Separate introductory phrases. Now, an introductory phrase is something that introduces an independent clause. Typically, with introductory phrases, you see VIP1, where the verbs are, the, ver it starts, the sentence starts with a verb, and it typically the verb ends in ing or ed. So, crying at the top of her lungs, frightened out of her mind, comma, or you have words like therefore, consequently, however. You need commas to separate those because they're trying to introduce the actual independent clause. The independent clause is so amazing that it needs something to introduce it. So, crying at the top of her lungs, comma, Hunter kept the whole house up all night. Frightened out of their minds, comma, Duke crumbled to Carolina. It's March Madness right now, so I'm going to have a lot of Carolina praises and a lot of Duke, uh... <laughs> Duke, you know, smashes. All right, so the next sentence. I love Carolina, semicolon. Now remember, you use a semicolon when you want to separate, you want to join two independent clauses together without using a coordinating conjunction. So I love Carolina, semicolon. Therefore, up, oh, introductory phrase, well, this is a word, introductory word, therefore, comma, I will not support Duke. So therefore, comma. And if you notice, when I say it, therefore, I pause. Remember, a comma is really just a natural pause in the sentence. Therefore, comma, I will not support Duke. Rule number four, separate all non-essential phrases. Now, a non-essential phrase is something that's not essential to the meaning and context of the sentence. Now, they're more politically correct. They're no normally known as appositive phrases. But for the, rule, for the purpose of commas, we'll call them non-essential phrases. So remember, a non-essential phrase is a clause typically dependent that or sometimes it's a phrase um, of just nouns and adjectives joined together that is not needed in the sentence therefore we need to separate it or sandwich it 
together with two commas. So Thor, who originates from Asgard, falls in love with a human. So the first question we want to ask when we look at a sentence to see if a comma is needed is VIP number two. <laughs> is this clause needed? Now, there are pretty much two steps that you need to take. Step one, pull the clause out. So you want to pull out the clause you think could be a non-essential phrase. Then step two, read the main clause by itself. So Thor falls in love with a human. By itself, that sentence makes complete sense. I don't really need who originates from Asgard. That's additional information. That's another thing to remember about non-essential phrases. They really are, all a non-essential phrase is, is just additional information about the subject it's referring to. So Thor, hey, I'm just letting you know, he originates from Asgard. Therefore, I need to sandwich that phrase in. So VIP number three, no change, sandwich the non-essential phrase in with two commas. If the meaning of the sentence changes, no comma is necessary. So I put a comma here, and I put a comma here. Now, if you read it out loud, Thor, who originates from Asgard, did you notice the pause? Remember, all a comma is in writing is a natural pause you want to give the reader. Now let's look at this sentence. The king of Asgard, Thor, saved planet Earth. Do I need a comma? Or no? Do, should I sandwich Thor in? So, the king of Asgard saved planet Earth. By itself, you could make a case that the sent that Thor is would be a non-essential word that's not needed. But remember, non-essential phrase. So, the king of Asgard, Thor, saved planet Earth. Comma right there, not needed. So, you leave it alone. Rule number five, join two independent clauses. Now, VIP number four, with comma plus fanboy. And remember, VIP number five, remember those seven coordinating conjunctions. Fanboys, at, for, and, nor, but, or, yet, and so. Makes the word fanboys. Use those seven coordinating conjunctions when you want to join two independent clauses in a sentence together. So, Mario loves writing and LaShonda loves reading. Mario loves writing is an independent clause. It stands alone. LaShonda loves reading. Independent clause stands alone. In my writing, I don't need to have those separate. I can join them with the conjunction and. However, they're two independent clauses, therefore they need to have their own identity, they need to have their own space. How do I create space or a pause to separate them? I add a comma. Rule number six, after a series of phrases, but make sure you remember, VIP number six, prepositional phrases. Remember a preposition um, is talking about location or direction of something. So you have prepositions like near, before, of, at. So after a series of prepositional phrases that are talking about location or direction, after that last prepositional phrase, you want to add a comma. So you can kind of almost treat prepositional, a series of prepositional phrases as a long introductory phrase. Go back to rule number three. So near the gate at the end of the field, so I have near the gate, prepositional phrase. At the end, another prepositional phrase. Of the field, another prepositional phrase. That's my last one, comma. The football team waited to enter the field. And then once again, if you read the sentence out loud, near the gate, at the end of the field, hmm, the football team waited to enter the field. So I have a natural pause after of the field. I need a comma right there. That's pretty much easy rules. Probably the easiest one after rule number five, how to join two independent clauses. Now, probably the most misused rule after rule number five, 
is rule number seven, joining a dependent clause to an independent clause. Now, rule number five and rule number seven, once again, are probably the most misused of the commas. Typically, most people forget, pe typically, people always never put a comma to join a dependent clause to an independent clause, and when they join two independent clauses, in writing, you typically forget about the conjunction and you just use the comma to join them. And then sometimes you just forget everything and you just use a comma, which we'll talk about in uh, Fumbling Fragments and Rambling Runoffs. So, rule number seven, join a dependent clause to an independent clause. Remember, an independent clause stands on its own. A dependent clause needs help. So think of a dependent clause as a little baby. A baby needs help. It cannot stand on its own yet. So therefore, it needs a parent or an independent clause in order for it to maintain its structure and to help make it make sense. On its own, this dependent clause, before James steps on the court, by itself, it makes no sense. It needs something to go with in order for it to make sense. He throws a peace sign to the sky. That sentence makes sense by itself, but I need to join them together so they'll make one cohesive, fluent sentence. Therefore, before James steps out on the court. Now, if you notice, you should, as you read it out loud or you mutter it underneath your breath, you should feel a natural pause. Therefore, after that, after when you feel that pause, you know there should be a comma that goes there. Before James steps on the court, comma, he throws a peace sign to the sky. Now, remember, when the dependent clause comes first, and then you join it to a dependent clause, well, I'm sorry, when the independent clause comes first, and you want to join it to the dependent clause, remember, independent first, no comma needed. He throws a peace sign to the sky before, James throws a peace sign to the sky before he steps on the court. See, I didn't need a comma because if you hear it, James throws a peace sign to the sky before he steps on the court. I don't need a comma there because I did not need to pause. What we typically see in writing is that when we do have the independent clause coming first, we still will put a comma after it. You don't need that. Remember, dependent first, comma. So, before James steps on the court, pause, comma, he throws a peace sign to the sky. So, remember rule number five, rule number seven. Those are your typically most commonly common mistakes. If you remember those two rules and then add on, add on the other five, you'll be doing great.